Hello, everyone, and welcome to Field Notes. My name is Russell Almaraz, and I am the Southwest Regional GIS Specialist and the Field Notes Regional Representative for the Southwest Soil Survey Region. As a regional representative, I serve on the Field Notes Review Committee. The Review Committee solicits and selects topics for each webinar. We have selected two exciting topics for today's live event. But first, let's go over a few housekeeping items. This is a Microsoft Live event and not a Teams meeting, which means you are joining today's webinar in listen-only mode. We encourage you to ask questions at any time using the Q&A panel. The Q&A panel should open by default. However, if for some reason your Q&A panel is not open, simply click on the question mark icon located on the upper right side of your screen. For closed captions, turn on the live caption button located in the lower right corner. <clears throat> Today's session is being recorded. Recorded sessions are available in Teams on the Field Notes channel and the Soil and Plant Science Division's YouTube channel. Again, thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed today's session. With that, I'd like to turn it over to our Field Notes moderate, moderator, uh, Dave Hoover, to tell you a little bit more about today's webinar. Take it away, Dave. Thank you, Russ. Hi, folks, this is Dave Hoover, uh, Director of the National Soil Survey Center in Lincoln, Nebraska. I spent a little time this weekend taking a look at old Field Notes. Russ had mentioned that there is a Field Notes channel uh, on, uh, on YouTube. And I look back there at the very first one that we had. Well, it seemed significant since this is number 30. And I listened to some of the things that, uh, that I said back then, uh, uh, back on March 9th, 2021. So that was the first time that we rolled out the webinar series. I talked about how it goes beyond the technical soil services reports that I used to review. I don't know that I see many of those anymore. Uh, as part of the scientific review process. Uh, we wanted to make sure that these webinars were used to share <clears throat> both innovation and accomplishments. I think we've done that 30 episodes later. Uh, we wanted to be confident and we showed our confidence that people would, would step up and share their own experiences and ideas and uh, investigations out in the field. And I think we have, we've had some wonderful ones. I wound up actually spending about an hour and a half uh, going through uh, different broadcasts going, oh, oh, I remember that one, or I remember that, and oh, I, I forget what they said on that one, and watching it again. I haven't had my daughter take a look at it because I was staying at, at her place, I was uh, up visiting her, and I said, oh, you got to see this one. So uh, uh, it was really good to take a look at some of those. I also remember presenting at a later webinar that these types of webinars just don't exist elsewhere. There are ones, there are many uh, agencies and organizations put on webinars, but they're often by the heads of those agencies, the, 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 the bureaucratic side that have other people put together their materials for them. And that's definitely not what this has been. This has been our field people dominantly presenting on field issues and sharing themselves what's going on, not sending it off to somebody else to present for them. And I think that gives a special uh, Thanks to all of you that have that have put these together and that have come to these and listened to them. Uh, it really makes for a unique experience. So 30 webinars later, I think we're still going strong. We're still getting ideas and it's still a great webinar series. As Russ had mentioned that uh, we have a couple of great presentations today. Uh, the first presentation that we're gonna go to is from Zach Von Abema from Idaho. He's gonna be talking about ecological site development aided by mobile data collection in the mountains of Eastern and Central Idaho, some of my favorite country that I worked in. So uh, Zach, I will turn it over to you right now. Sounds good, I'll share my screen if you wanna let me know when you can see it. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, 
Thank you, Dave, for the introduction. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Zach Van Abelman. I'm an ecological site specialist out of Idaho Falls, Idaho. Um, so over the last five years, one of our office's big projects has been uh, working on initial soil survey over three survey areas in eastern and central Idaho. Um, these surveys primarily covered public land managed by the U.S. Forest Service. Um, so along with the soil mapping that is taking place, we've been developing LRU level ecological site descriptions, which is what I'm going to talk about today, uh, as well as our use of mobile data collection tools to support that process. So first off, I want to introduce our office and give credit to everyone who's been involved at least to some extent in these projects. Um, in the first picture to the left, coming back from our final sampling backpack trip of 2021 is the Idaho Falls Soil Survey Office crew, uh, which includes myself, uh, soil scientists Nick Kozlowski and Caitlin Palmer, as well as soil scientist and office leader Carla Rabernack. Um, and then because of our project locations, and our need for collaboration. We've worked very closely with the Dillon Montana Soil Survey Office, uh, pooling resources and collaborating on backcountry data collection trips. So in the middle picture in the orange jacket is Benjamin Moore. Um, he's the Soil Survey Office leader in Dillon, Montana. That picture was taken on a sampling trip into the Sawtooth Wilderness area um, that he came along to help out with. And then Last but not least in the picture to the right, hiding behind the slim stem buckwheat is uh, world renowned ecologist Grant Peterson. Uh, so during these projects, there's been a lot of development and use of tools and products from outside our office. Um, so as I discussed those, I'll try to give credit to folks uh, who helped to develop those and I'll apologize ahead of time if I leave anybody out. All right, so this picture here is looking down into the Chamberlain Blake Basin in the White Clouds Wilderness Area, um, which is part of our Chalice West Survey Area. Uh, and it's actually one of my favorite spots in Idaho. Um, the plan for this presentation is to cover a little bit about the extent of our survey areas, the development and evolution of our, our land resource unit, rangeland ecological site key, and our ecological data collection uh, intensity, methods, and tools, um, which will focus on the use of mobile data collection um, and then discuss how we've been facilitating ecological data transfer to NASIS. And then I'll also briefly dive into the tools and methods for ecological data analysis that we've been using and finish talking up about what, light, what work still lies ahead for us in Eastern and Central Idaho. So for initial soil survey projects over the last five years, our Idaho Falls office has primarily been working in three survey areas over two different MLRAs. Uh, so when I joined the office in Idaho Falls about three years ago, <clears throat> data collection and map unit development was focused in the ID703 survey area uh, shown in the brown polygons there on the map. And that's part of MLRA 12 LRU2, the Lost River Mountains. Um, this area encompasses the Lemhi Range, the Lost River Range, and portions of the White Knob and Pioneer Mountains. So then in 2022, uh, we began focusing on the ID701 survey area and MLRA 43B, uh, which is at the green polygon on the map. This area uh, we've been referring to as the Chalice West, and our focus for this current year has been in ID700, which is the purple polygon, um, which covers the Sawtooth Mountains. It uh, sends down to the towns of Stanley and Ketchum, and goes down south towards Haley and Fairfield, Idaho, into the Soldier Mountains. The ID 700 survey area, which is also shared with the Moscow Idaho Field Office, and the ID 701 survey areas are both in MLRA 43B. Uh, they span five different LRUs, uh, which the boundaries will likely need to be modified at some point during the project. And this area spans two national forests uh, the Sawtooth and Salmon Chalice National Forest. And within those forest boundaries are four wilderness areas, including the Frank Church Wilderness Area, the largest wilderness area in the United States outside of Alaska. Um, as you may have guessed, being a rugged and mountainous area, topographical influences play a significant role in, in the soil forming processes and thus uh, our ecological site concepts. So for context in regards to topography, um, I drew a line from the south end of MLRA 43B um, that travels to the east end of MLRA 12 into the Beaverhead Range at the Idaho-Montana border. 
uh, and that line covers approximately 125 miles. Um, so I took that line, I created an elevation profile for it. Um, starting in Fairfield, Idaho, around 5,500 feet, the line goes up and over the Soldier Mountains, goes across the Sawtooth Mountains before dropping into the Wood River Valley um, near Ketchum. Then the line goes up and over the Pioneer and White Knob Mountains, drops into the Lost River Valley, climbs near the highest peak in the Lost River Range in in Idaho, Mount Bora, 12,662 feet. And then at approximately 75 miles, the line drops into the Pissimeroi Valley, climbs back up the Lemhi Mountains, drops into the Lemhi Valley, and goes into the Beaverhead Mountain Range of the ID 720 survey area. So over that 125 miles, the line uh, goes over seven mountain ranges and gains a total of 60,000 feet in elevation. So a lot of up and down. So then this picture, it's from the Bighorn Crags area, the Frank Church Wilderness area. Um, it was taken on a data collection trip, backpack trip that we that took place this field season. Uh, it's actually in the ID 720 survey area, but we were able to go help out the Dillon office on that trip. And I had to include, include the picture since it was uh, such a neat picture. So similar to our ecological site key, our data collection processes and focus has have evolved from the start of the ID703 Chalice West survey. Um, inocular macro plot survey was taken at nearly every site, and this survey breaks vegetation into functional groups, it includes a plant census, total site production estimate, visual estimates of canopy cover by species, <clears throat> excuse me, estimates of production by species, a correlation to an ecological site from the LRU key, and it gets assigned a habitat type through our forest service habitat type classification method. And then once the initial site, uh, pet on and veg data collection have been established, that data is reviewed and then we determine uh, which sites are representative of a specific state, state within an ecological site. And we pick those for return visits. Um, these return visits involve a much more intensive data collection process, um, which includes line point intercept, plant production, canopy and gap intercept, um, continuous line intercept, which is a measurement of shrub canopy and soil stability. And so the goal of our tier three data collection is to attempt to get at least three intensive data sets for each state within an ecological site. Um, this wasn't always possible for each site, but it set a goal uh, to most accurately describe the range of variability within each state and the potential community structure and composition that, that we would encounter. Um, lucky for us, we were able to, uh, we had an agreement with the Forest Service and they would dedicate one or two employees um, for each field season uh, to help in the collection of those more intensive data sets, which has proven to be very useful. Okay, so knowing a little bit about the landscape, you can get a pretty good idea of, of what the major contributing abiotic factors are in shaping the ecological site concepts. So starting work in the Chalice Deach survey area, uh, an ecological site key was developed by Brian Christensen along with the Idaho Falls office that attempted to capture all these abiotic conditions that were thought to be the most impactful to the associated plant communities. Um, as data was collected and pedons were correlated to these ecological sites on this key, we were able to fine tune all the metrics associated with these conditions. Um, it was an iterative process and we were continually refining the key until it most accurately represented uh, not only the abiotic conditions present, but the communities that resulted from the conditions. So as you can see on this slide, the present key version is 1.7, which more or less was the final version of the survey area for the survey area. Um, it went through six other previous iterations and because the key worked so well um, in the end for the abiotic the abiotic conditions present um, and the conditions weren't significantly different in our other survey areas. We just took versions of this key and applied it into those survey areas as we begin mapping there. So the way the key works, it initially breaks a site into three primary groups. Uh, the first group includes sites that receive additional moisture, which include riparian areas, meadows, marshes, and fens. And this is generally determined by depth of seasonal water table or depth of organic horizon um, and can also be dictated by landform. The next two major 
breaks or groups involve depth of soil. So there's shallow and very shallow or moderately deep to deep. And after a determination is made for one of these three groups, then the key breaks on other abiotic conditions, which include um, soil chemistry, volume of coarse fragments, landform, slope steepness, surface fragments, and soil textures. All right, so these two pictures are both from data collection trips in wilderness areas. Um, the first picture was from a backpack trip into the White Clouds Wilderness Area from June 2022. And the second picture was prepping to fly into the Frank Church Wilderness Area that same year. Uh, we flew into a, a backcountry gravel airstrip along the middle fork of the Salmon River, um, collected soils and ecological data for about five days, and were flown back out, uh, which was all a fantastic experience. So as far as ecolog ecological data collection, in the Chalice East survey area, our primary focus um, was for intensive data collection in the rangeland land use series of the survey, uh, mostly because of their significance towards permitted grazing on public lands. And then as we moved into the Chalice West survey, we also began to target forested ecological sites for data collection. Um, the forested data collection includes a, a line point intercept survey, forest inventory, and understory production. And then within that forest inventory survey, we're collecting species composition, canopy cover, uh, average tree height, diameter, and basal area by, by species, as well as age of select trees through coring and ring counting. And then we also determined that um, due to the remoteness of a lot of these locations and difficulty of access, um, it wasn't necessarily efficient to plan return trips focused on intensive data collection um as we had been doing in the past with our with our rangeland protocols um so with this in mind we modified our collection protocols to collect line point intercept data often on a modified 50 foot transect uh, in conjunction with a modified forest inventory for forested sites and still completing a full ACMA survey for the rangeland sites so this all takes place simultaneously um, as we're collecting soil data for initial mapping All right, so once we've collected all our data, uh, how are we using it? So this slide is my, my plug for getting all your ecological data into NASIS um, and using mobile data collection tools to make that easier. Uh, so once you get your ecological data in NASIS, it becomes directly tied to a site and pet on at the database level, which uh, automatically makes that information behind it much more powerful. Um, once that data is in NASA, so it also greatly increases your, your data analysis capabilities and potential. Um, with all the work done by folks like Andrew Brown and others, we can pull veg data directly from NASA using the R package to LDB. Um, once it's in R, the analysis, analysis potential really is pretty endless. Um, one example that we've been able to do in our office um, is develop a relatively simple script that pulls uh, chosen vegetation related data sets that you load into your NASA selected set. Um, it then calculates canopy cover, frequency, um, production metrics by functional group across multiple data sets from multiple sites and spits them out in an Excel spreadsheet where the numbers can uh, be directly transferred into community tables in the edit database uh, when you're draft data, drafting or updating ecological site descriptions. And so what this does is it uh, creates a repeatable process that helps remove any user error. Um, it increases efficiency and, and most importantly, promotes uh, data-driven ESD development. I also believe that as we get more ecological data into NASIS, um, the greater chance that more folks will be inclined to continue to develop tools to help analyze and use that data um, that we can all, all take part in. And so after that last slide, you're maybe thinking, yeah, it's valuable to have data in NASIS, um, but a lot of our data is collected on paper data sheets uh, in the field or in non-linked databases, and it's a pain or very time consuming to enter it in or hand transfer it to NASIS. <clears throat> and I agree with this. And uh, luckily, there's some great tools out there or that are being developed to aid in the process. Uh, one tool that we have been experimenting with over the last few years and are using quite extensively now is Survey123. 
Uh, Dan Perkins, who's our senior regional soil scientist, uh, created a form that mirrored our, our data collection needs for the ocular macro plot survey. Um, this form can be populated on site, uploaded to AGUL for storage, and then at the end of the field season, that data can be directly mass imported into NASA's veg plot tables. Um, Margie Patz, who is our ecological data quality specialist, has followed a similar process uh, for developing survey one, two, three forms that cover our more intensive data collection methods, line point intercept, plant production, forest inventory, um, and that can all also be imported directly into NASA's veg plot tables. Um, what using survey one, two, three in the field does, um, it eliminates much of the hand data entry into NASA's or it creates avenues for easier post field data entry, um, which has saved us a huge amount of time on the back end. Uh, we've also had luck developing a process to move data from the DEMA database into NASA's. Uh, for those who are not familiar with DEMA, it's an access database developed by Hornada, um, and it facilitates the collection of intensive rangeland data protocols, uh, the same, same intensive protocols that I talked about earlier. So using R, we were able to build scripts to process data coming out uh, of DEMA, ready it for a direct import into NASA's. And then this process um, can be used to easily transfer larger data sets that you had previously stored in DEMA, as well as any new data collected uh, through the DEMA interface. And because it is an access database, all this data can be collected digitally in the field as well or entered back at the office. Um, but a lot of work has been done in the last few years in the development of tools for, for ecological data analysis. And as the amount of ecological data in NASA's increases, I think these tools will continue to improve and become more standardized in the development of site descriptions. All right, so moving forward, um, what's next for our field office on the ecological side of things? Uh, what we're looking at over the next couple of years will be completing mapping on our Chalice West and Sawtooth National Forest areas. And over that time, we're going to continue to collect ecological data at varying, varying intensity levels for use in future ESD drafts or updates. Um, we'll continue to prioritize rangeland ecological sites based on management needs, uh, but we also need to start addressing the forested ecological sites across those land resource units. And luckily, um, when we do get around to, to start working on those forested ESDs, we should have quality data sets available um, that'll help us characterize those sites. And then through analysis, be able to identify any specific unique abiotic conditions um, that that make those sites what they are. And that is pretty much the end. That's all I have. Thanks, Zach. Uh, taking a look to see if there's any questions here. There are a couple of questions that have come up. Uh, let me read those off to you. How was your experience relying on mobile devices when recording data in the backcountry? Did you have any issues with batteries in low temperatures, inclement weather, screen functioning in rain, et cetera? Yeah, so it definitely gets a little more complicated in the backcountry uh, with the mobile data collection interfaces, Survey 123 in particular, because you're, you're relying on your mobile de devices uh, with limited battery. So we had, we had been able to purchase a couple um, battery banks to recharge devices. And really the, the method we sort of adopted was rather than entering all your data in the field, you would take a point um, at, at the location, um, not populate any of the boxes, use a paper data sheet for all your information, and then populate it when you got back to the office um, or a combination of the two. But yeah, the biggest, the biggest issue um, it was a battery life on whatever device you're collecting the data on. I can understand why. Another question, uh, are ecological site specialists throughout the country using the Survey 123 form to enter their data? You know, I'm, I'm not really sure outside of our region. I know um, in the Northwest region here, we've we started to use it more and more. It's been sort of a a trial and error process on what works and what doesn't work. Um, the the ocular macro plot survey we've been using, um, we started 
in 2021 and we we mostly have all the bugs worked out of it and it runs really smoothly um but as far as as far as other offices i'm not really sure um it'd be interesting to hear what well, appears like it'd be fairly uh adaptable to other areas do you think uh, it would take a high degree of programming to uh, make it more adaptable to a different type of environment no i think one of the nice things about the survey one two three platform is you can develop a survey and you can share it to say another field office and then they can modify it to fit whatever whatever specific data collection needs they have um and that's that's sort of what's happened with our our composition survey that that Dan Perkins developed. Um, I think there's three different versions, at least two different versions now that uh, just have slightly different uh, population categories, um, but they're basically the same form. So you know, I think it's a pretty easy process, especially once you have a base form developed to be able to share that and modify it to, to fit specific needs. Great. That does it for our questions, Zach. So again, I thank you for your presentation. You bet. I want to remind people that the next webinar is going to be December 19th. So give yourself an early Christmas present and, and attend the next Field Notes webinar. Now we'd like to turn to our second presentation of the day, and that's over to Amy Koch from Hawaii, talking about the Hilo Forest Reserve. Amy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dave. Let me get my screen situated over here. Aloha, everybody. You're good. OK, perfect. Well, I am very excited to be here today and that Hawaii is featured as one of the 12 top tough digs in the 2023 soils planner. Um, sometimes we feel a little forgotten out here sitting in the ocean, so it's always good to be remembered. Um, the photos here are from the, the planner. So the top one is Patrick Niemeyer. He is a soil scientist that did majority of the, the tough digging and work for this area, but I did cover a northern portion in my mapping and we met up together. Um, so we worked together on a lot of the field work as well. Um, and then there I am on the bottom couple, just a couple years ago. This work was actually done um, in the early 2000s as part of an update work for Hawaii Island that was published in 2012. So today we're going to talk about a katina and the Hilo Forest Reserve on the slopes of Mauna Kea on the island of Hawaii, also known as the Big Island. So here you can see the purple outline is the rough boundary of what we call the Hilo Forest Reserve. It's located on the windward or eastern side of Mauna Kea on the island of Hawaii, and it's approximately 82,000 acres in size. Um, here on the left bottom, you can kind of see Mauna Kea jutting up. It's about 14,000 feet elevation from sea level, much bigger than that if you count all the way down to the ocean floor. Um, and then you can just kind of see how the forest reserve sits on the flank there of the wet side. So what happens is we get trade winds that move the rain in. It can't get up and over Mauna Kea, so it just kind of hangs out and just rains. So it's definitely a tropical rainforest. You can see on the right, the green, lush, very thickly vegetated area. Um, some of the lighter green areas we're going to talk about um, are some of the variations in vegetation and soils that we found. Uh, private lands, federal lands, and state lands are, are the three main ownerships in this area, mostly state forest reserve land, um, but there is a portion that's a Hakalau wildlife refuge for mostly for bird habitat. Um, that's a part of this as well. Resource concerns in the area include invasive plants, uh, feral ungulates, and also insects. There's a lot of avian malaria that's an issue for some of the native forest birds. There's 
no or very little access. There's no roads um, going into this area, and that's on account of there being a lot of steep gulches. You can kind of see those drainages. They start up on Mauna Kea and get wider as they go down and empty into the ocean. That is the blue area for you landlocked people out there. Um, that is the ocean showing there. Um, so coming in from the bottom, you can see a lot of cultivated lands or developed lands. Uh, there's also, because of that, a lot of invasive species that have come in kind of along that boundary on the eastern side. So that makes it even more difficult to get into this area. Um, and then coming from the top is equally difficult. And then to add to the mix, there's bogs kind of th mixed throughout in low-lying areas that collect water and they're wet all year round. Um, and plus it's very difficult to cross over some of those deep gulches and drainages. Uh, so how we kind of got into this area to explore it, we did some limited hiking from the top and the bottom and some of the few trails that exist through it, but we did have the um, unique, I guess, experience of taking three different helicopter trips to explore this area further. So there was one that was just a reconnaissance where we did a flyover with GPS and video and taking pictures to kind of pick up on the signatures. And then one where we actually did get to land and get out and do some field work for the day. And there, um, if you want to look more, we'll talk more about the different soil types that were mapped, but we did also do full uh, pet on characterization for three different soil types in the area. So the outline you see here in purple was the existing 1973 soil map. It was all mapped as the Akaka series, which is a moderately well-drained soil. When we finished our update, um, that turned into multiple map units of different compositions for three different soil series, the Kaibiki series, the Akaka series, as well as a new series that was created for the bog areas that we'll talk about, and that's called the Onamea. So just to give you a little bit more orientation and soil forming factors, so here's a slope map of the Gila Forest Reserve. So you can see um, some of the darker brown areas are those depressional or flat areas that catch water. And so those are generally boggy. There's actually even some lakes that have formed. Um, you can see the blue kind of coming in. You see it a little bit more closer to the ocean, but those are those steep drainages as water flows down the mountain of Mauna Kea and increases with some slope and then that that load increases and is just slowly weathering away into those those steep gulches. Um, also, there's undulating underlying lava flows that are um, they're covered by volcanic ash. So that's kind of the underlying landscape. A lot of these are late stage Mauna Kea flows, so very blocky, very slow moving. So that kind of adds a hummocky um, flavor, I guess you could say, to to the landscape. So moving on to precipitation, here's the annual rainfall map. Yes, that is 5,840 millimeters of precipitation that you see there in the middle of the forest reserve. Uh, it gets a little bit drier as you go towards the ocean where it's warmer, and then it gets drier as you're moving up the mountain in elevation and it's getting cooler. So here is a beautiful photo that we took from the helicopter. So looking, if you were kind of at the ocean looking up, Mauna Kea is there in the background. You can see those clouds. This was early in the morning. You can already see those clouds kind of sitting there. That's about the, the cloud level. Things above that tend to be drier. And then over the course of the day, those clouds just back up and just continuously rain in this area. Um, the vegetation that you're seeing, it's, as you can see, very forested. This is actually a really nice area of intact native forest where we have a koa overstory. So those are going to be the tallest trees. And then ohia would be an understory, also a native tree. And then the understory would be 
all kinds of different ferns and mosses, but predominantly this hapu'u tree fern. So this area, believe it or not, is actually one of the easier areas to get around in this forest reserve. Areas that have more of the invasive species, such as strawberry guava, um, other vines and spiny things are much less desirable for hiking through. So there's our helicopter. Um, so it was pretty exciting. Also a little daunting uh, for it was this would have been the second time I was on the helicopter. The first time we went, um, we just did our reconnaissance tour. This time we had to bring everything with us just in case those clouds backed up and the mist rolled in and the helicopter couldn't make it back. Luckily it did. We we got lucky and we didn't have to spend the night out in the rainforest. Um, this bog area was the only open area where a helicopter could land and this was the middle of summer which is the driest part of our season and nothing like jumping off and sinking about a foot in in your rubber boots into that nice saturated muck this was from the helicopter is a little daunting flying for my first time no doors on but what do you do you just keep going um, this is looking over Hilo as we were heading out of the airport and here's some smiling faces yes it was the rainforest and uh, it was rainy but we did get lucky and have some sun um, there I am on the left in the middle, we have David Kloschnitzer, who was our forester and ecological site specialist at the time. Patrick Niemeyer, they're standing in the Aluhe fern that's almost as tall as he is. And then on the right, we had a student intern, Eric, who came out to help us dig. And there's my motto there, the worst day in the field is better than the best day in the office. So hence all those smiling faces we have. So just put some more photos in here just for fun. So here's Patrick. Of course, you know, like I said, I made him do all the 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 real nitty gritty digging, but uh, I was there. You can see a pink bucket in the foreground. I was the baler. We would take turns digging. You can see the mucky mess over there on the left. Uh, it's pretty fun trying to sample the soil when your hole keeps filling back up with water. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we made it happen. And here's Patrick again. This was, I believe, the Akaka series um, that we dug out, and this was probably our sampling pit, I believe. So here is a block diagram to give you a little more information about the soils and the landscape that we have. So you can see kind of moving up, you have the summit of Mauna Kea. Things are flowing down into the Pacific Ocean. Um, you can see the line work kind of lightly drawn on there. This is a infrared photo that we found to be very useful to help pick up different digital vegetation signatures, especially in the native ve natively vegetated areas. Um, you can see it's about six kilometers from the top of Mauna Kea to the sea floor. Hawaii is a hot spot environment so things spew out of that hot spot and form from the very bottom of the ocean and continuing to grow up um, until they come up above the surface and then in this case it continued to grow um, this is one of our believe it or not older landscapes here on big island with lava flows that are 64,000 to 300,000 years old and those are covered in, covered in a blanket of weathered volcanic ash varying from 1 to 20 meters thick. Uh, the longer or the older that landscape is, the longer it's been sitting there and able to accumulate ash as different ash events happen, whether they be Mauna Kea or other volcanoes on the island. So here we have um, kind of I have labeled what the different map units are that we mapped. So there's three main soil series. We have the Kaiviki, Akaka, and Onamea, and they occur in various combinations kind of depending on the terrain. So the steeper areas have higher percentages of Kaiviki, which is a well-drained component, and then minor components of the Akaka and Onamea. 
and then in areas that are less deep, they catch more water and therefore have a complex of a coca, which is a moderately well-drained component, and then kaiviki with minor components of the onamea, which is poorly drained. And then nearly level areas and depressions serve as a catchment area for water. Uh, they're dominated by onamea with a coca minor components um, of kaiviki. So here's a cross section, again, just kind of showing the, the landscapes and the landforms. Uh, you know, the steeper the slope, obviously the water is going to move through the soil. Uh, we get a lot of through flow. Then you kind of get into um, where you have a less steep slope. You're going to see the Akaka series there with the red box. And then down in the toe slope depressional area, we have the Onamea series. And again, you can see that it's weathered volcanic ash over Mauna Kea lava flows. So here is a cross section of how water moves through the soil. So precipitation, which comes on, as we talked about, very high amounts. So you're getting infiltration and recharge going down into the aquifer. And then you can see there's a winter water table and a summer water table. Our wet months tend to be October through March, with summer being a little bit drier. But as you can see, even with the summer water table, that Onamea series is still saturated to the surface. And then all of that goes through and discharges is to one of the uh, steep gulches or drainages, and then that goes out to the ocean. So again, this is just showing again the soil distribution of the different map units and kind of the much more detailed information that we able to provide in the updated soil survey versus that one big line drawn around the whole forest reserve that was like, yeah, this is pretty wet and mucky. Like, let's, you know, worry about that later. Um, but this is really important because this is a very important catchment area watershed wise. Um, lots of native intact forest here, so a lot of preservation and conservation work being done. So it was really valuable to have this additional information. OK, so here um, the Kaiviki series is a beautiful picture of a classic Andesol, at least what our Andesols look like. I like to describe them as a layer cake of sorts um, where you have different ash events that have kind of accumulated and then you have weathering going on. In this case, it's a well-drained soil, um, but it is still going to be a per moisture regime. So that means that it never dries out. Um, they're around 30 to 40 centimeters. You can see a darker layer showing up. That's actually like a former surface layer. So kind of that was the surface at one point and then more ash fell on top. And if you look at the lab data, you can sometimes see spikes in that carbon because of that phenomenon that's going on as the, the layers kind of continue to build with different ash events. And this is kind of looking, this is from the bog, looking towards what would be the forest of the Kaiviki series. So poetry, nice overstory with really um, developed and, and taller ohia trees, and then understory of uh, hapu'u tree ferns. And so for the taxonomic people that want to know, this is a hydrous, very hydritic, isothermic, acrodoxic hydrodan. Um, and as I mentioned, it is a peridic moisture regime. And so you can take a look um, at the OSD if you're more interested in learning more about the pedon. So moving on to the Akaka series. So this again is highly weathered volcanic ash. Slightly less steep, two to two, two to ten percent slopes, making it a moderately well-drained soil. You can see the colors are pretty similar, but you're getting a lot more of those uh, iron oxides coming out into solution, so a little bit redder in the colors. And there would be redoxomorphic features in the areas where there's a fluctuating water table. And there you can see the depth of the water table fluctuates from 50 centimeters in the winter to 80 centimeters in the summer. 
This is a picture of what the Kaka area would look like. You can see some dead trees. Those are Ohia trees um, that have died either of old age or just as things kind of change um, with that drainage pattern over time. You can see the light green is what we call the Aluhe fern. It's more of a ground cover fern um, and is generally indicative of wetter areas. And then the ohia that are there tend to be a little bit more stunted in their growth. And here the Kaka series is a hydrous, very hydritic, isothermic, acrodoxic hydrodan. Um, and so the idea is that the through flow of water laterally through the profile prevents or severely limits any kind of reduced conditions. So it's the water is there, but it's constantly moving because there's continual input from rain. So it doesn't actually meet the criteria for aquic. Here's the Onamea series. This is the one that forms in the bogs. You can see it, despite our best efforts of bailing, there's water there in the bottom of the hole, but you can see that highly decomposed herbaceous organic material covering the highly weathered volcanic ash. And then um, here we bailed it out, but generally this, you know, if we had come back to this hole, probably within a half an hour, um, maybe a couple hours, it would be filled back up to the top. So it's always saturated. And this is a picture of what the bog looks like. Some native sedges, grasses, and then also some other native shrubs that are kind of interesting because they grow in a stunted or a kind of miniature format due to the, the saturated conditions. So the Onamea is a hydrous, very hydritic, non-acid, isothermic, histic, and new aquand. So this does meet the aquic um, conditions because it's saturated year round. And there is through flow, but there is definitely still um, that there's more um, reoxomorphic features. So with that, um, I will take any questions. Thanks, Emmy. Uh, waiting for questions to get published. Surely someone has a question about Hawaii Looks like and there, our there amazing are soils. We'll see, we'll see if they okay. just get uh, promoted. Um, one question I had while we're waiting for those is: uh, sure. is there is there lateral flow along that uh, the lava flow contact underneath, or does the water get uh, down that far? I in most in this environment, it doesn't even get that far. Um, but our, in general, our aquifers tend to be pretty deep, um, so there would be flow along the, the lava flows, um, and it's varying depths to where that is, depending on a couple of factors, the age of the landscape, and then in this area, it's still um, intact, but in areas that have been disturbed, um, you know, there's different depths depending on how much erosion has happened, which is a common occurrence given our rainfall. Okay. And now some other questions have come in, uh, sure. such as what are the daily temperatures like in the Hilo forest? Um, so the bottom of the forest reserve is about 2,000 feet and it goes up to probably about 4,000, 4,500 feet. So it's, I believe, um, isothermic for the most part. So not a lot of fluctuation, um, both during the day and then seasonally. But, um, you know, it's a little chillier than it is down at sea level. So, you know, maybe a chilly day is like, you know, you get up there and it's like 60 degrees. So we got to put on extra clothes being at Hawaii and all. Got it. Another question. Did you do any mm -hmm. revision? Did you do any revisions or develop any eco sites during the mapping? Yes, we did. So David Kostnitzer was in the photo there. So he was, when we were doing the 2012 update or extensive revision of Hawaii Island, we developed at that time, it was kind of, um, we were a little bit ahead of the curve in that we were developing full ecological site descriptions. So I believe this area is pretty much should be done. It's 159A. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head the actual eco site, but um, yes, they are developed. But then both soil survey and 
uh, ecological sites, as you know, are always an ongoing and updating uh, adventure. So there could be continual updates, but they should exist um, and they should be in both web soil survey and edit. If you want to take a deeper look. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. And another question, what kinds of wildlife did you see while working in the forest reserve? So we were lucky that we didn't see that I at least that I recall um, any wild pigs would be um, one of the, the biggest things in this area. And there is also um, there are also wild or feral cattle um, that kind of have gotten out of from domestication and kind of rove up in the, the forest reserve. Uh, other than that, lots of beautiful birds um, providing nice song and pretty to look at um, when you can see them, they move pretty quickly. But the, the ungulates are very destructive to this environment. They root a lot. Um, they can contribute to pretty serious erosion issues as well as spreading uh, invasive species that are plant species. And then they harbor mosquitoes um, also as they kind of make areas that are more um, subject to being saturated and anaerobic. The mosquitoes kind of hover around that and those are a real issue for some of the native birds that we have. Okay, thank you. Another question, can you explain again about the winter water table and summer water table and why that soil didn't meet Aquic? Sure, here we go. Um, so the winter water table is higher. That is our rainy season. Um, and then the summer water table is, but if you look at it, it's 80 centimeters down um, for that summer water table. And even the winter water table is about 50 centimeters. Um, so we, I remember this being a big issue and we went back and forth and kind of went through taxonomy, went through our data that we collected. This wasn't, I mean, we were able to look at this soil in many different places, um, not just, you know, on the one day that we went out in the helicopter. And so mostly it was because it just didn't meet the criteria in taxonomy for the aquic moisture regime because there weren't, there wasn't, the water is not sitting long enough, whereas in the Onamea series it is, but here it's just, you know, there's enough slope that that water is just continuously moving so you don't get those anaerobic conditions in the reduction. Thank you. Okay. And we got, uh, I think, time for maybe one or two more questions, and one of them is, is fire a part of the natural ecology? Not in this area, no. It's so wet all the time. Um, it's not a natural part of this. And also being an island, you know, that wasn't inhabited until pretty recently, um, even by the native Hawaiians, um, fire, there's not a lot of source. We don't have a lot of thunderstorms generally that would be a source of igniting the fires naturally. So when we do have fires, it's often anthropogenic, um, people said. And it tends to be in much drier areas, not in this area, even on a dry year. Okay, and the last question to you is, what will be the next area you investigate and will any details be available? And I think they mean details rather than facts and figures, but details out there to assist. Sure, yes. So Anne Tan is our project leader in the Kaila Kikua office. She just arrived last month and we're really excited. We were without a project leader for um, about three years, at least a full time. Uh, Mike Coleman, the previous project leader, kind of continued to fill in after he moved to California, but we're really excited to have Anne. I know she's still kind of getting her bearings and looking at, you know, what some of the priorities are, but I know there's a lot of projects that are going to be coming about, especially as we have since done a lot of the provisional ecological site work. We were a little bit behind the mainland in, in that, but kind of it's one goes with the other. As you kind of look at one thing, it brings up issues and update projects um, that need to be fixed to, in order to address and continue to, you know, develop those ecological sites. So I can't speak for certainty, but I hope that, you know, I know there will be a lot of projects going on once Anne gets things going. And um, I'm 
hoping that there will be some detail opportunity as well, because it's always easy to get people to come to Hawaii in the middle of winter. Rue. All right, well, okay. got, Thank got you. one got one more that came in, Amy, so I'll oh, go ahead and ask that okay. one. Sure, sure. I noticed, that, I noticed there were some higher clay containing horizons. Are clay films not common in your mapping area for some reason? Does the very high precipitation prevent clays from accumulating in a single horizon? Great question. So we have clay sized particles, but we do not actually have clay minerals in these areas. They're so young, they haven't been able to form that far along. They're mostly aluminum and iron oxides um, that form as well as complexes that form with some of the organic matter um, in the soil. So we don't have those classic clay films because we don't have you know, those classic clay, that clay mineralogy. We have different things that just have a lot of clay sized particles. So there's a difference. All right. Thank you for your answers to all those questions. And oh, thank that's you a lot. To, it was. <laughs> and thank it's you good, uh, for sharing your island experience. And Zach, thank you for sharing your uh, mountain experience. And again, we'll look forward to more great presentations on December 19th. Thank you all for attending, and thanks again to the presenters. Bye now.